You're listening to the Tilehurst End Podcast by Reading fans for Reading fans. Hello and welcome to the Tarnhurst Den Podcast with your host Mark Mayo and as you may have noticed with Football Shutdown the podcast has suffered a little bit recently so we thought we'd work hard behind the scenes and line up a few interviews for you to keep the uh, football fires burning during this break in play. So without further ado we'll start off with Graham Murty, the 106 team captain of course, member of the Brentford promotion winning team as well and that team that finished 8th in the Premier League. A Reading legend by all standards. So let's jump in then to the Tartless 10 podcast. Meet Graham Mercy. Be loud and be proud and back the boys and make some noise. Come on, you ours! Shout out to this week's podcast sponsor, ZCZ Films, showing that age is no barrier to being a hooli hoop. Graham Mercy, it is a privilege and a pleasure to have you on the Tartless Den. How's it going, mate? It's going very well, thank you. Obviously, it's a little bit um, strange times at the moment, but uh, thankful to have a fantastic job at a great club and, and spending more time with my daughter than I would normally, so taking my blessings from that. Yeah, absolutely. It must be a, a, a weird time as someone who who's sort of plies their trade getting out on the coaching pitch and in, I suppose in a classroom to an extent as well to have to kind of do that remotely from your position at, at Rangers. How is that sort of faring at the moment? It's, it's actually a brilliant challenge for our group. Our coaching staff have really embraced it and um, we're trying to upskill ourselves uh, in our own quiet way to, to make sure we meet the needs of a, of a new digital age. We want to kind of dominate that, that kind of aspect of our delivery to the kids and, and our staff have, have taken after it full full bore and we're going after it wholeheartedly. So I've really got to commend them, um, albeit we recognise there's a lot of challenges going on. I think it's a really good time to be a really good strong part of a, a coaching cohort and a coaching community that are finding new and innovative ways to engage with a generation of players that are in unprecedented times. Yes, yeah, certainly is unprecedented at the moment. And uh, we'll go on, we'll talk a little bit later about the sort of coaching philosophies and everything as uh, as you, as someone who, you know, you've been around Reading, their youth academy is uh, is yeah, esteemed, I think we can fair, fair to say, and Rangers as well. So we'll talk a little bit that, about that later, but let's cast our minds back then to 1998 which I mean February seems like a long time ago now but how far how long ago does it feel like now that you signed on the dotted line as of course a a record signing for Reading at the time when you joined I can can still remember the phone call actually really clearly um, from York to say that there was a team interested they were going to pay X amount Um, they weren't prepared actually to tell me who it was but they had a brand new stadium so I could work out from that it was (laughs) Reading um my, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, and I flew down to Reading, met um, the late Tommy Burns. Um, God rest him, what a lovely, lovely guy. And, and I got captivated, captivated by the vision of a brand new stadium, a brilliant project, and uh, an opportunity to really advance my career. But it, it, it really seems like it's fixed in my mind how clear those times were because it was such a big, big moment in in my career and in my life and also in in my girlfriend's life at that time it was a a massive decision but once you got into the into the bones of the club and the the ambition and and where Sir John and Tommy wanted to take the team there wasn't really a great deal to talk about other than when could I start yeah as someone I suppose you'd you'd spent all your life really in the the northeast and your north Yorkshire and and to come down to Reading at that moment, I suppose it, it, it's almost underappreciated in a way how much of a sort of cultural shift in a way that is. Uh, and and as as young men want to do, I, I phoned my old man up straight away. Um, so listen, this is this is an opportunity. What do you reckon? Who's the manager? Tommy Burns. You'll be fine. Go and do it. Mm. All the feedback from everyone that I talked to about um, Tommy as a person, as a coach. Um, the club and, and what it was trying to do and, and everything around it just felt right and, and it was it was a really exciting time and I, I have to say that I had challenges and I had knockbacks and I had um, times that were difficult but thought that from that moment I'd made 100% the right decision. Uh, I spoke to one of the directors at York um, not long ago, and he said, oh, they were really glad they'd knocked back some bids for me previously, um, which they didn't actually tell me about, I have to say. (laughs) 
but they thought that for me and for the club that that was the best fit and, and I have to kind of agree with that. Yeah, and one man who you, you must have come across very early on was Sir John Medeski. And this is, I suppose, before the world got to know Sir John Medeski and obviously before he was Sir John Medeski in a lot of ways. How did you know, how did your first impression of him come about as a as a man who he's probably the first to admit wasn't, you know, isn't a footballing guy from birth as it were, didn't make his money in, in football, but was a an instrumental person at that time in, in finding Reading a way to, to sort of progress through the leagues? I, I, well, I don't. I don't think Sir John has had enough credit for the for the way he went about it and acknowledging that football necessarily wasn't his area of expertise. But he he, he recruited people who could give him the expertise and who could take the project further on. You know, and, and I think that all right, there was there were obviously there were challenging times trying to bounce back as a, as a so-called big club trying to get back into championship and then progress onto the Premier League, but. So John hired some really, really, really strong people to to help push that on, and I think there was a a lot of brilliant people at the club over an extended period. Um, he talked about Redden's Academy we just off when we had a chat there. Um, hiring of Eamon Dolan um, and and the work that he did to underpin everything that the academy does is something I, I think that has been overlooked but the people that Sir John got in to inform his business decisions on a, on a football front were really 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 strong and actually were well in keeping with the ethos and the spending potential of the club at that time yeah and that um that sort of spending potential is you say it, it it feels weird to sort of think about reading as a a big club that was scratching sort of at the surface of a of a big um of a big sort of time in the premier league and everything like that but as you joined, I suppose you were kind of central to that, as I say, the record signing, and, and your career actually started off a little bit difficultly with injuries and those sort of things. So by the time we got into the sort of, you know, that second division period when we were play- in the playoff final with Walsall and, and obviously the Brentford promotion as well, mm. did you feel like there was almost a sense of relief that we'd finally got out of the second division and it was kind of onwards and upwards from there? I, I think the you've been very very kind initially to say that I had a, a, a challenging start <laughs> I think that I'd, I had a honestly I had a nightmare I had a real struggle with uh, first uh, a recurring hamstring injury from my lower back and then once I got back in I got taken out of the game at Luton where I, I really badly damaged my ankle which cost me nine months um, I have to say the support that I had from the staff and everyone around the place was, was phenomenal in, in terms of getting that right and there was a, there was a there was a culture almost of um, oh, this is this is just going to be hard. It's not going to be our time. It took a long time to actually get past that to 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 really start pushing on and, and cut our cloth to be a really really solid, easily identifiable, recognisable Reading team. And there was a there was a there was a method of our play. We were really really fit, really quick, aggressive, very very well organised. And that became a template that we took forward and moved on and on and on from from going from a team that wanted to play fantastic, expansive football, but were possibly um, easier to play against on on challenging pitches, should we say. We be, we became fairly hard nosed and difficult to play against. I would I would say that towards the middle part of it, towards the time we were promoted into the Premier League. I would say there were very, very few teams who actually wanted to play against us. Yeah, that's funny, actually. Um, you, when I've spoken to other th- sort of former players, it's that sense of being a, a pesty team that the Reading yeah. and and a lot of a lot of fans, I think, of opposition clubs and, and everything. Reading has a reputation of being a bit of a nice club in a way, so it's refreshing, I certainly think, to hear of the team being capable of having a, a bit of bite and and you know being able to do the dirty side of the work because the club has managed to over the years develop I suppose maybe it's the part of the country we're in or something but it has developed a reputation of being like a, a friendly family nice club and that doesn't necessarily lead to thinking about the team as a as you know a doggy dog team in a, in a sense I, I think it's I think it's a really really good point because um, there's a generation of fans that have grown up with the Medeski they've grown up in a fantastic environment with Premier League football and, and really expansive football um, and we we weren't there at that time we weren't ready to be that team at that time 
Um, and, I, and I'll never forget Steve Coppola has taken, taken us to a, a team. I won't tell you which team it is. And he said to us in the last meeting before he got on the bus, don't be taking them by this lot. They'll be nicey-nicey. All their staff are lovely. They'll be really welcoming. And when they get on the pitch, they're an absolute nightmare. They're a menace. They're a nasty, hard team. And I get, I kind of got the impression that was what he wanted. He wanted yeah. a team that were, <laughs> were lovely and nice to talk to and really engaging and really polite. But as soon as, as, soon as it came game time, it came business time, you did not want to face them. Uh, and I think that's why, where we where we got to. And I think that that was really getting the order of of precedence down right. That first and foremost, we didn't want to be someone that was nice to play against. And once we established that, then we could really, really go and express ourselves. And I think some of the football that we've played throughout throughout the time and, and since has been really of the highest order. But we loved actually establishing the fact that no matter what you did, we were always going to be there hanging around and you could never quite get rid of us. Yeah, and there was that uh, there was that period just to get out of the second division when, as I said, we kind of fell in that playoff final and then, and then went to Brentford. What are your memories of that? of that day at Brentford as a as a sort of a moment to to get over the line in the sense that we kind of crawled over to to an extent well if you if you, if you go back the, the um to the to the to the playoff final i i've got real distinct memories of of hating every second of it i, di- I didn't enjoy i didn't enjoy the way i had played personally i didn't enjoy the experience i my, my wife takes great joy in reminding everyone that from that day that we got beat it was actually us landing on holiday a week later before I actually turned to her and actually started talking to her because <laughs> I took because I took it that badly. That's probably something wrong with my psyche at the time, but that was that was just my level of disappointment from that. And I was I was terrified the week the year later that we'd fall at the final hurdle again. Mm. And it was really interesting in the game against Brentford. We went one down. I'll never forget Eddie Williams just walking up to me and just saying, "Keep calm. We'll get one. We'll get one." And he was so assured, and I was sitting there thinking, it can't happen again. It, it just can't happen again. We need to, and it, it could, he could almost see me getting more tense. And he just came over, and he was really calm. He just went, don't worry about it, we'll get one. And when it finally came, and I've got to say, there's no one it w- I would rather it fell to in my, the whole of my career than Jamie Curitan. Just, just to have that level of instinct... There's, there's, no, there's no real surprise he's still playing and still banging goals in and still able to give of himself the way he does right now because of his of his instincts and his understanding of, of striking and finishing. But to go and get that goal, my overriding rem- uh, memory of that was dancing, jumping up and down, going mad, and one of the stewards on the pitch at Griffin Park asking me to calm down. <laughs> and I, I turned around just to give him a mouthful, to really slaughter him, said, you realise it's taken nine months... Plus last year, we're getting rid of it. And as I looked, the Brentford fans were on the pitch. And I was like, ooh, he might have a point there. <laughs> we might have to wind our neck in a little bit. But, but what, a, what a day. Andy, Andy Hughes running down, down the pitch with Kuro on his, on his shoulders. Just All that stuff was just a massive outpouring of emotion. And... I actually think it was a validation of what we did because we were really, really good that season. Well, it's funny you should mention as well the Curitan that to fall to him as well. You, you, you're right. You think if it if it falls to ninety percent of the players in that scenario, you're going to leather it. You're going to kind of get something on it to guarantee. But to have that moment to think and chip it over the goalkeeper, I think is a. It just it shows to you that even you know as as professional footballers, it takes that extra level of five percent for a striker particularly to think yeah okay let's just calm it down chip it over the keeper and then we'll get the goal it, it is that someone else isn't it it's, 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 it's having the capacity and that's what we, I keep on talking to our young players about it's about having a, a, a really really broad toolbox of abilities that when the time comes and, and the game is on the line what can you pull out of that toolbox that's appropriate to the task now I would have ne- never had a broad enough toolbox to pull that finish out of the box I would have just lashed it as hard as I could and ended up on the motorway. But Kuro had it in the bag to really, really, at uh, uh, an ex- accelerated speed, pick the right finish. And the finish, when you look back on it, was outstanding. It was outstanding. And I, and, and I still remember seeing Ivar trying to get back. 
Yeah. Um, Ivar um, was playing in that game, wasn't he? And Hunt, he was playing in that game as well. Yeah, yeah. And it was a couple of teams, wasn't it? Yeah, and, and just looking at that and having the capacity to go and do that at that stage was was phenomenal. Yeah, and it's um, it, it's interesting then we go into the the championship as ill, first division as it was there, and, and that team, far from... It, far from sort of slowing down or thinking okay let's have a consolidation year well maybe you did think let's have a consolidation year but to go straight through and it, it really is the sign of momentum that Reading had in that period to go straight through into the uh, into the playoffs the next season and, and to be on you know a couple you know it almost feels like a, a few minutes away in a lot of respects from being in the in the Premier League or from being in the playoff final how do you how did that sort of momentum carry it through was it a case of the club or you know Alan Pardew saying let's take a consolidation year or was it everyone saying actually let's just go for it and let's just keep going as we can well I know, I know it gets lots of stick but it was it was Pards saying we're not here to make numbers up we're going to go after everyone no one's going to know what you're about you're going to be a shock to everyone and he had, he had I remember he had t-shirts printed up that said the fastest team in the league and I thought, oof, that's a, that's a bold statement. <laughs> so we're, we're warming up in t-shirts to say the fastest team in the league. I'm not, I'm not sure we can do that. But it was, it was a sign of his confidence that, no, 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 we're not, we're not going to wait for anyone. We're going to get after him. And we, we went after people. I mean, if you think of, there was opportunities and, and times in there where we would play really nice football. But there was also times there where Pards would shout from the side and we'd go 4-5-1. We'd have Husey behind Nicky Forster. We'd be really, really solid defensive. And then those two would just run the legs off people. And they would go like from the halfway line and get a goal, and that was that was that was enough. But the, the pace and the power that we had, and and the the ability to get after people, and once again not not be a nice team, was great. I st- I still think we were we were good enough to go up that year. I was I was I was gutted to lose those games because I, I thought we were I thought we were worthy of getting to the playoff final that year. Yeah, it's 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 one of those you look at, isn't it? That Wolves away game and. And it, 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 it turned into one of those sort of away games that, that sort of goes down in history for all the wrong reasons and a number of fans who were there will, will testify that as well but I remember being in uh, it was one, of my, one of my first games actually in the 2003 season um, with the second leg and it just felt like it, did, it was one of those sort of sobering moments for the club where it did kind of just feel like it, it was one step too far and it kind of reined us in a little bit do you feel like to then yeah. think it's possible but you know we need to work on a few things yeah and, and, and I think that it would have happened too soon for us I think that what we, what we managed to do was become a really really solid team in, in, in the period from then and until we got promoted where we were nearly there we were, we were, a, we were a nearly team mm. for a period I think um, we were just missing a few components and it, it took the it took the genius of Steve Koppel really to, to, to marry and blend those elements together and, and looking at that the disparate characters and personalities within the group the different different strengths all meshing together is a, is a really 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 delicate balancing act and, and, and until you get that bit right until you actually really have the ethos behind it and people buy into it it's 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 something that's not really built on on solid foundations. But I think we took that time and really put some good foundations in um, underneath the first team bit in terms of infrastructure, in terms of um, understanding our our place in in the football pyramid. But never were content with just being another team. We just still wanted to have a, a an identity of our own, which was which was quite pleasing, I have to say. Yeah, and and. and as you mentioned then with, with Koppel coming in obviously that was after the I suppose it was a, a, a for the short term at least a, a knock back for Pardew to have left for, for West Ham I, I, I imagine you were gutted at the moment but I, I must ask was there ever a moment where Pardew said to you you know you can come with me if you want and go to West Ham <laughs> Uh, between you and me and these four walls I, I saw I saw Pards at West Ham and, and he would he said that they had, had a a, a chat about taking people um, and I actually got to work with Pards later on at Southampton and, and mm. he, he he said that he would have liked to have taken people from that team um, but you, you look at it and, and you, you try and make sure that you do what's right for yourself and I think when you look at Pards, Pards wanted to test himself at a bigger at a bigger stage and a bigger with a bigger club in his mind and that was right for him. I think that it would have been a real, real 
interesting conversation for any of our players at that stage mm. to say, do you know what? I want to do the same thing because it happened later on um, with people leaving the football club and I think it would have been a challenge at that time because I think if any of us had, had, had gone, you wouldn't have seen the growth that we had later on and, and the foundations laid for, for what Steve Coppel was going to do. Yeah, and, and you know, with with Koppel coming in and you becoming captain, how did that relationship work? What was because Koppel's known as someone who would, you know, he, he chooses his words very carefully. He wouldn't say things that didn't need to be said. But as you were the captain, you surely would have been the person who was, you know, in his ear the most or getting the hmm. the, the insight from him. What's how did that sort of relationship <laughs> work? You don't know you don't know Steve Koppel very well, do you? <laughs> See, I think I think you said it really well that he never used words that didn't need to be used. So as as captain, if the guys had any issues, I would I would bring them to him. But it, it wouldn't be um, on a daily or even weekly basis. It would just be as a, as a, as it unfolded. But what I would say is, what he managed to do really quietly was was get people on board that he wanted on board, and he would he would he would just observe everything. And it was one of the major things I used to say to the youth team at the time. Um, was guys you need to understand this the manager sees everything they didn't get it they think right I'm, I'm training with a different group I'm off the other side of the pitch I can I can lower my standards slightly I can do whatever I want blah 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 but the gaffer would notice everything mm. that was one of his major strengths he would see everything and, uh, and he loved nothing more than bringing up something that had happened a week earlier with people who didn't think you knew about it but then he would also love having a laugh that doesn't kind of fit in with his with his image he'd love to drop a joke in that no one else understood because he's that clever and walk off cackling to himself <laughs> and, and I'll never forget him joining in um, he joined in training we did a circle and he came and stood next to me and he's, he's got these boots on and I'm looking at him going Gaff what are you doing you, you've got a bad knee you can't join this and he just looked at me and deadpan just went I wanted your grandchildren to know at one stage you trained with me, Mertz. <laughs> I was like, oh, you cocky. I tried everything I could to get him in the middle, and we couldn't get him in. We could not get him in the middle. We could not fight. We could not get him out. It was it was brilliant. And I'm looking at him, and I'm going, right, okay. He's got something about him that holds you. He's got something about him that says, I know more than you. Just you take care of what you need to do. Let me take care of everything else. You go and do your job, and, and as a footballer, actually, that's quite relieving. That I can just focus on what I need to focus on, and I, I'm really clear with what my job is. I've got someone with a br- really vast knowledge behind me, and he will only tell me to change something if I'm doing something wrong. He'll help me get better, but he's ready to step in if he sees I'm struggling, and that's what he was really, really good at. I suppose it's almost like quiet, quiet satisfaction is the is the permanent sort of uh, personality type that he has, isn't it? Or the permanent mood that he's in, and that's also it makes me think that people like Wally Downs and Kevin Dillon had such a massive impact as well because they mm. they must have been the voice essentially of of what he wanted you to you know the day to day the shouting at you everything that he needed to do as much as as much as putting a team together. Is a blend of disparate characters and personalities and, and capacity. Putting your backroom staff together is something of a similar ilk. It's, it's an art, putting your backroom staff together. And I, I refer to it all the time. And I, I don't give Kevin Dillon as much credit as I, as I should do because I, I honestly used to come home day after day after day from training and, and say to Karen, he's doing my head in. He's doing my head in. He, honestly, honestly, me and him, me and him, it's just every single day we're at loggerheads every day, every day, every day. Oh, why? What's he doing? It's just, it's just winding me up. He's winding me up. And it's taken me until I've had a bit of distance from it and, and seen the method behind it to understand that Kev, Kevin Dillon was trying to get me to improve my reactions, to improve my understanding of myself, to say, when he gave a decision against me as a referee, he wasn't doing it just to wind me up. He was doing it because it was going to happen on Saturday. Mm. He was doing it because you can't rely on referees. You have to move past these things that are going to go wrong in your career and in your match and in your daily habits so you can go and fix what needs to be fixed. You don't need to get all caught up in the emotion of it now. And I try and give the, the players that I work with now the benefit of my experience 
and I tell them overtly, I'm not as I'm not as subtle as Dill, and I can't believe I'm saying that. I'm not <laughs> as subtle as Kevin in say, in, in doing it. I, I involve them at every step and just say to them, I'm doing this because you're gonna you're gonna have a challenge in this occasion because I want you to grow, and 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 they get it, but I, I see so much of myself in them where where they lose the plot in training for five minutes. At the top level, five seconds is too long. So five minutes of, of emotional unbalancing is, is too much for them. So we, we put, automatically put those roadblocks in to their development just to try and help them really understand how they would refocus back into their task to help them in their career moving forward. And I honestly don't give me enough credit for giving me an understanding of that and of myself. Yeah, and that mentality aspect of it was such a huge part of that team that as we move into talking about the 0506 team and, and and in terms of that squad as it sort of was built over the couple of years before and, and players even like Kevin Doyle coming in the summer before, which were the kind of players that you can remember looking at and thinking, oh, I'm really impressed. This is a this is a, a, a noticeable mark and improvement in, in sort of the quality of player that we have here. Um that's a, that's a really interesting question, that, actually. Because it's really interesting. When you, when you bring Kevin Doyle and Shane Long in, they're trying so hard to impress. Kind of a kind of a hard-nosed group. Mm. And you're looking at them and you're thinking, are you going to get to the right level? Are you going to get to the right standard? Are you going to get... And, and, and credit to Brian and the people who brought Kev and Shane over, saying, right, do you know what? That's their ceiling. Where are they currently on their, on their journey to the ceiling? How much growing have they got to go? And, and I think that rather than it be a player that you brought in that you said, right, he's going to take us to beyond where we were, I think you, you had the blend of the group pushing each other every day to be better and an environment where they could, we could mess up and, and, and not be dug out in a way that demeaned people but in a way that held people to standards. And I think that you look at the group collectively, the one that goes under the radar the most for me because Dave Kitson gets credit for being a, a wonderful talent. Doyley, obviously, with the career that he's had. Leroy with his goal scoring. Hunt, he went on. St- Steve Sidwell went on. Eve asked, you look throughout the team. The person I look at who was the biggest example of growth within a brilliantly nurturing environment is Nicky Shorey. Mm. You bring Nicky Shorey in and you look at him and he, he's, he, he was quite a slight figure with a wonderful left foot. But the way he grew to be a pivotal member of that group um, with his quality and his understanding of the role and his, and his development as a player to becoming an England international, from, from where he was to where he got to, the growth within that environment was phenomenal. I'm, I'm not sure there are too many more environments where that level of growth could have taken place. I think it was the perfect storm it was a perfect place for him. It was the perfect place for us. And the complementary skill sets and personalities we had within the group enabled us all to get further than we would have done, I think, independently. And, and I think rather than look at the one person that made us all get there or added to it, I would look at each person having a responsibility to help uplift the others. And I think that's that's the overriding thing I took from the team. Yeah, and there was that sense of obviously the the sum of the parts and everything like that. The fact that it was sort of brewed up as as you say, the perfect storm is almost is is a better way of thinking about it than I can think of myself. And and what was the you know as as the promotion word was banned and all, all I remember all the hmm. all the talk and everything like that as we were going through the season and obviously. You know, when you look at the fact that we won every game in November and almost every game in December, you surely would have known as the turn of the year came round that we were heading for glory and everything. What was the, what was there one moment when you actually sat down, maybe maybe before Leicester and before everything else, where you thought this is this is definitely going to happen now? No, there was there was there was there was there was times when you look at it and you think this is this is this is going to happen, but you, you you're quite you, you say it to yourself. Obviously, there was, there's other people, there's other players who might say differently, well, we're definitely talking about this and we think about this within small groups. But the overriding principle was, right, let's, let's motor through. Let's be absolutely relentless and absolutely batter this out of the park. And we did. And we battered it out of the park. And I think when you, when you look back at that team, I remember, I think it's Palace away. And, and you, 
go and you go and you can see the goal. What I remember from that team was the, the psyche and the mentality that, regardless of what happened to us on the path, we were going to go straight back in people's faces again and again and again and again. And whatever happened, we were going to react and flip everything into a positive. So whenever someone seemed to score against us, we went straight back up the other end with real intent and caused them a problem and either scored or created a chance. And that was the mindset that the team had. Was regardless of what happened, good, bad, indifferent, referees, decisions, tackles, whatever, we were just going to overcome it and plough on. And and the team was relentless. When you look at the way it ground out game after game after game after game and win after win and result after result, the Luton game that we lost, we should have won. When we were annoyed, but we just said, yeah, let's get back on it and smash it again. To go from the Luton game to not, not losing another game is as much an indicator, I think, of the mentality of the team as as the rest of the season. Because it would have been really easy. Oh, we're going to win it. Oh, we're going to do this. Oh, we're going to get promoted. Let's just let's just sign off. No, 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 no. no. We're going to carry on. And then when the gaffer started changing changing the team to make sure that um, there was people rotated in and out of the team, that was a measure of the squad, not just the eleven. That those people came in and had a positive impact on the game and on the team, and that was a as, as a real, real good indicator that the environment around the place was right. Yeah, it's interesting. I remember distinctly that um, that Luton game, but also this. It's interesting you mentioned the Palace game because I've seem to remember there was a period where we we were on TV about three weeks or something like that in a row. And I just kind of thought, they're waiting for us to lose. They're surely waiting yeah. for us at some point to, to capture the moment of the defeat. And that Palace game, James Harper scored, and it was literally two minutes after we conceded with only about ten to go. And that I think that one for me was the moment. And as, as you say there, that was really a sign that you can, you can throw as much as you want at us, but nine times out of ten, we were still able to get something. And, yeah. and that is, the, as you say, a testament to, to the sort of culture as much as the quality. Do you know what? And 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 Steve Steve Couple again. He said so much stuff that you don't realise sticks with you. But I, I use it all the time with my lot. No one needs to be right on a football pitch. He used to say, "No one needs to be right. The team just have to figure it out." Right? Okay. Because you've got a lot of people who have who are very strong and very confident people. But if you've got a lot of people who don't actually care to be seen to be right, as long as the team are successful, that is that that's a real good ethos and, and we had the bit where we could sacrifice for one another and actually collectively batter ourselves through a brick wall for a toe poke in the 91st minute and the team would be successful and obviously the goal scorer would feel really really good but it was a team thing mm. and, and I think that's where lots of people wrote about, about Reading being a team of no stars which really used to annoy me and as much as we kept playing on the fact of we're, we're all in it together, we did have stars. We had real, real high-level operators in that team. It was just that they didn't care who got credit as long as we were all successful together. And, and, and that bit of responding in the right way, once again, goes back to the underpinning of the blend within the squad. And then obviously we, uh, we managed to secure it in, well, promotion was secured in early March and then uh, champ, the championship itself was secured. Four, I think it's 14 years ago, about two days ago. Um, yep. It was that derby game, and and if you uh, personally, as a fan, I've always had the derby game in my mind above the Leicester game because I wasn't at the Leicester game. I, bit, as I say, I was a bit younger then, and the away games me and my dad started going to the following year, so I wasn't at the Leicester game. So the derby game, weirdly for me, has always been the one that I've sort of had in my mind as yep. the big celebration, the big moment. It, which, which, what are the differences between those two days for you? Because it must be strange in a way to have two consecutive matches of, uh, obviously early in the season, of just pure celebration. Well, we, we, had, we had the Leicester bit where, where we didn't know on the pitch. The lads didn't know. We were, we were kind of walking off the pitch. We didn't know it had happened. We we're like wandering off, all right, we've, we've got a draw. We're a little bit disappointed, but we're walking off. And the fans are still they're going mad. And we're like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> and, then it, and then it came out that we'd we'd managed to do it that was just and you don't actually know what to do we're going to celebrate but why are we going to celebrate we're going to do the run and dive we're going to chat and, we're going to, and you're trying to get around as many people as you can and as many photos as you can and there's a video and I'll never forget Leicester sending a, uh, some champagne into the changing room which I thought was a really really classy way of doing it mm. and then it, and then 
we go into the week and the week's kind of blurry because we've had a, a mad thing where you're looking around at people and you're saying we're Premier League footballers now <laughs> but you're not because you've got to finish it off and see the Derby game I, I've just been looking at it on Twitter it's a, it's a, it's a five goal um, blowout in the second half it's only a five goal blowout in the second half because Steve Cop went mental at half time he went mad at half time because he couldn't identify his team from the first half performance from what we'd been all the way through the season we were nowhere near it and he ripped a strip off us at half time and he it, it didn't do it often so it had massive impact mm. and you could see the response the response of how we played in the second half was a direct response to being promoted and having a week of oh my god this is amazing to kind of turgid first half to oi get your heads back in the game this is what we're about bang and he told us in no uncertain terms that if you're gonna if you're gonna be doing this, you're not gonna be playing for the rest of the season. You need to go and sort this out. And then we go, bosh, off we go. He used to say to us all the time, ten minutes of your best will win you the game as long as the other eighty minutes is acceptable." Well, the first forty-five wasn't acceptable, but the second forty-five was some of, some really, 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 really good stuff. Really good stuff. Yeah, well, I remember that as 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 uh, you know Shane Long popping up with a couple a couple at the end. You do sort of think that it's it's almost the the nightmare scenario that Coppel would have envisaged in his mind beforehand that after the promotion was yep. sorted, everything kind of drops off, and we still had like six games to go. And that you can actually, in a way, you can almost really harm yourself for the next season if you yep. do let those, because then the doubts sort of creep in, and you think, oh, maybe we're not as good as we actually turned out to think we were. And everything. So to go and get that, and then to have the, you know, the famous scenes on the on the pitch at the end afterwards, it yeah. was a real, it was a really, I think, a really important moment for the club. And it, it was brilliant to share that with the fans. You know, I mean, all right, you you, you get promoted one week, and the fans are going to have a great time. But in front of a full house, you don't want to send those guys home disappointed. You don't want to send them home flat. You want to energise, and I think with the energy that you're you're able to generate, and credit to Steve Coppel for that. You're able to generate. The fans feed off that, and we feed off that, and the fans feed off, and it, and it becomes cyclical. You know what I mean? You keep on working with one another to try and help push. And I think you said it earlier. When you look at Reading, and you look at its footballing history, it's not Newcastle, it's not Liverpool, it's not it's not someone that's that, that it's not an area that's got this rich history of um, ridiculously successful, well-backed teams. It's it's kind of a it's kind of a team that needs them both to work together. Mm. The team and the fans need to work together to generate it. And we had that. We had that. And, and getting those people on the pitch to celebrate, which was a fantastic achievement, but ultimately a brilliant, brilliant football team, felt like, do you know what? This, this is something you need to bottle. You need to bottle. If you could bottle it, you'd make a fortune because the feeling that you had then, collectively, was immense. Yeah, and that brings me on to the moment of the interview. I'm sure you've been absolutely, absolutely dreading this question, the inevitable question coming up of the QPR penalty, and I'm sure uh-huh. you've been thinking, oh God, he's going to ask me about it eventually. But let's discuss it then. That, that The feeling, obviously, as you mentioned, you, the feelings of it happening and everything, but... I remember distinctly beforehand it was brewed as a moment because you're the last outfield player who had played over you know 10 games or whatever it was to have not scored yet and was it truly something that was discussed beforehand and, ever, and you, maybe were you yourself going around telling people if we get a penalty you even a decent I free was, kick I was, no I was, I was taking penalties for, for three or four weeks beforehand every day in training I was taking penalties <laughs> and I, Kevin Dillon was like I've never missed a penalty mercy you aim at that post and you bend it and I just thought there's no way in a, in, a, in a football match I'm going to be able to remember that I'm just going to smash it as hard as I can. <laughs> but, I, but I identified the area I wanted to hit. And am I right in thinking, the week before, I didn't play. I think it's, it's Chris Making or, or Ulysses played and we got a penalty. And I'm sitting in the stand with harps cause, and I'm looking and I'm looking and Steve Couple looks and he finds where I'm sitting and he started to laugh. <laughs> I remember it distinctly that I'm sitting there raging because I should be on taking a penalty and it's not going to be the last game it's one before and he's laughing and I'm thinking oh wow see if I don't get a goal I'm the only one I'm going to be livid so when it came around there was no, there was no doubt 
that was taking it. And and I remember um, the QPR lot trying to make it last for as long as possible to try and make me nervous. And they were messing about and they were arguing and all this kind of stuff was going on. So I just took myself off for a little wander with the ball and then mm. brought myself back in. Um, but what I will say is I've been threatening Kingsley for three or four weeks because he was giving me loads of stick. You're not going to score. You're this, you're that. <laughs> I said, see, see as soon as I score, mate, you're getting it. You are getting it. And I u- actually used the clip of it to introduce myself to the Rangers players up here. So when I actually came up here and moved as a coach, I went, hi, I'm, I'm Graham. This is, this is me. And I might as well get this out of the way now. There you go. This was me. A little bit of an icebreaker. Scored a penalty and battered the mas- mascot. <laughs> and now we're just talking about the reason. So they're not talking about this new coach that's coming in. They're laughing about it and they're talking about it. And then that was a brilliant icebreaker for me to say to them, this is one of the best moments of my career. Bang. There you go. And it was, it's, it's brilliant. I Honestly, I'm not dreading the question because how can you dread something that had been built up so much? You then manage to execute it and you walk onto the pitch as the captain of a club that have just got 106 points and won a championship. It's honestly one of the defining moments of what I managed to do. And it, and it was the it was the goal that got the record as well, wasn't it? So that was just to have that record. Do you still do you still look at other teams how they're doing now? Obviously, we're talking in a weird situation with Liverpool, but I suppose they think they might be able to get it still. But in terms of you know as the seasons have gone by over the years, because we as fans do, obviously we still have the chant, we uh, we still do look as it comes round to this time of the year and see what the other teams are doing, whether they can get it. Do you still do that as well? Do you still keep an eye on, on whether other teams can get the 106? Of course I do, because remember, uh, not long ago, Newcastle Newcastle went for it a bit. Yeah, I yeah. got close. Um, and my, my brother in laws a Geordie, so he's a season ticket holder and he's given me all sorts of stick. So I take great pleasure in telling him that they're not as good as we were. <laughs> um, but I, I think I think to not to not be defined by the number is, is difficult. We're still referred to as the one hundred six team. Yeah, and and, that, and that's fine. But the the big achievements are along alongside getting that and, and being promoted, getting into the Premier League the first team, first time. I I don't take away just the points total. I I, I take away that that was the best team the best feeling of being a part of a team that I've ever had. And there was some pretty memorable celebrations, I'd no doubt, or maybe not so memorable as the case may be, <laughs> but there was um, there's a, a urban legend that Sir John Maleski was gave a speech in Purple Turtle. I don't know if you can can cast your mind back to the sort of antics that went on back then and, and, and how obviously it would have been such a such a, a huge celebration for the players as well. I'd never made it to the purple turtle, mate. So you'll have to ask someone else. <laughs> um, I, I, th- I think the the, the bit that you, you have to understand is we, we'd had a a bit of time in Marbella before the last game to have a, a to have a bit of time as a as a as a playing staff, and and we kind of wanted to get past the celebration because we'd had our celebrations earlier. Hmm. We'd had our celebration when we got promoted, and then when we won the league, and then. We got we got this. We get the final day, and you get the trophy, and that's all rolled really, really well and good. I, I was already starting to think about next season. I was already starting to think about, oh my God, we're going to be playing against Liverpool. This is my team. I'm going to get a chance to play professionally against Liverpool here. This is insane. Right, let's have a really, really good time, but let's not go too far because <laughs> it's not it's not going to be too long before you're going to have to start dealing with those guys. But when when you actually finish that season and put it to bed, I think it's really important that you you enjoy it together. Mm-hmm. And you make sure that you you show your appreciation for the people who've helped you along the way, not just the guys in 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 the changing room with you, but everyone. And, and I think that's something that will always really resonate was the atmosphere and the collective work by everyone that doesn't get to get on the pitch. Uh-huh. We're the ultimate ex- we're the ultimate expression of the club because they get to see us on a, on a Saturday. No one gets to see the work that's done behind to support the players. No one gets to see the work that's done to make sure that that player's family have all, all got tickets or this player had an issue in the week or anything that's gone on behind. But we were the ultimate expression of a really, really, really high-functioning football club. We were just the little bit that everyone got to see. And I think it was really important that over that summer, 
you touch base with those people and say thank you. And that, I suppose, that was part of the the transition then from being a Championship club to a Premier League club. As, it, as, as you make it sound very clearly, like the club was almost ready in that side of things to be a Premier League club. It had it got its it got it got its bases covered in terms of generally around the club, but also the players. The preparation for that Premier League season was there a couple of people a bit more nervous than usual, a bit too overconfident, perhaps. I don't think it was anyone overconfident. I think we were all just relishing the challenge. I mm. think you get, you're getting a chance to measure yourself against the best. And I think, do you know what? I think the game against, excuse me, I think the game against Middlesbrough was a fantastic barometer for us. And I think it was a really good indicator of us because we, we spent the first period of the game watching how good Middlesbrough were and saying, wow, these guys are good. And then it took Nicky Shorey again to actually say to us, fellas, don't worry about them. Let's just be us. And he, and he, he really galvanised us in that game to come back and win it. But that really gave us a, a massive jolt of confidence to say, we don't have to be Arsenal. We don't have to be Chelsea. We don't have to be Liverpool. Just being the best us we can be, as we've done over the last little period, is going to be enough. Because we, 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 we are automatically, when you're a new team going up, you have that, that challenge to try and be worthy of being a premiership team. So sometimes style changes, sometimes personnel changes. We would have been having a real distinct possibility of losing our personality and ident- identity if we tried to be all things to all men. We just had to be the really, really best expression of what a Reading team looked like. And I think in that in that season, we managed to do that. Is there one game for you that does kind of stand out as your favourite, be it a victory or even for me, I'd, I'd be torn between selecting potentially the, the the home draw against Man United as my favourite game for that season because that I've always said to people when they say, what's the best goal you've seen live? That Cristiano Ronaldo goal where... Yeah, thanks. In all fairness to you, I don't think there's anyone on the planet who could have who can stop someone because I just remember it being... You know, oh, he's in a position. Blink, he scored, and that for a defender. Sort of to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> for a defender, that sort of moment. Even it, even as a Reading fan, I kind of think, yeah, to be able to to play those sort of players and, and have those at your stadium is a special is a special thing. Right, I I I I looked at that right. So I'm with, you play Man United, and and the defenders would go away with Wally, and we'd we'd look at every final third entry they've had, and look at what they do. And I looked at Ronaldo, and the first time he got the ball. In the three games before we played them, on his first reception, the fullback would go and press him. He'd do a trick one way and go the other way every single time. Three times in a row, fine. He gets the ball in the first two minutes, and I'm right. Whatever, whichever way he goes, he's going to go the other way. He just knocked the ball 30 yards down the line and legged it. <laughs> and I was like, oh no. Oh, I am banging trouble here. As I'm trying to catch him, and he just fired this ball across the box. And I was like, yeah, this has gone up another level. Or two. Or three, right? This is going to be a struggle. And I think it was later on in the game that he, he actually got at me in the box and turned me inside. And I went back over it as I, as I used to do, and I looked at it, and he got it over my foot and over Sonko, but under Marcus's hand, yeah, into the bottom corner. And I'd never seen anyone with the capacity to do that with, at the speed he could do it at. So to hang on to him for as long as we did, and to get a draw against a team that were as good as them. Was a was a was a brilliant brilliant thing, and I, I changed shirts with him at the end, and he just said, "You're a really good team. You've given us more problems than anyone else so far this season." Now you don't know whether he's just saying that to be nice, but as I'm trying to find my lungs in the back corner where he's just run me for the 19th <laughs> time in the game, for him to say that is a is a real good feeling. Even though you walk in and you're a little bit gutted because you wandered up against Man United and you're like, oh, "Why well, would I love to hold on to it? Wouldn't that have been a really really good thing for us to to take away from the season?" Managing to beat Man United would have been would have been great, but sometimes you have to hold your hand up and say the guy's just special. Yeah, and I suppose as well, you think from from his point of view, he's taken he's had to settle for a point at a team just come up, yep. and he could have been you know it would have been justified in a way for him to have been a bit more petulant with you and to you know be effing and blinding, but for him to have actually thought you know maybe this is a decent point and he's happy with that is that is a again a good sign that. The Reading were were punching at such a high level that for you know years before couldn't even dream about. 
Well, I, I talked to I talked to Darren Fletcher at Scotland Squad after that game, and as as you're walking in and you're chatting, he said that Sir Alex Ferguson went into the change room and said that might be the point that wins us the league this year. And I'm thinking, wow, that's that's what I'd be the greatest manager ever, telling his team to be to be grateful for a point with us. <laughs> And that's, that's brilliant man, man management by a fantastic manager mm. saying the right thing to his team to make them feel good. But for us, looking back on it, do you know what? Yeah, that 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 kind of is a really good way for us to look at it as well. So we can, we can take that as well. I, I never really had a problem with any, well, not too many players being petulant about the way that we went about our business. They Honestly, they were the, t- the players that you play against at that level were just busy getting on with business. They weren't too caught up in histrionics of it. They just cracked on and, and got on with it. And I never, in, I think in the second season in the Premier League, we, we beat Liverpool. And I remember Torres being like on fire that season. And we we gave him some fairly harsh punishment, I would, rec- I would remember. Mm. And he never blinked. Never blinked once. Just got up and got on with it. There was no, no histrionics. He just got on with it. And, and that's the thing that I would take away from the Premier League that is that the top players aren't aren't busy moaning. They're just busy finding a way to beat you. They're yeah. putting all their energies into going and being the maximum of them and actually working out the way. And, and they work out the way to beat you faster than anyone else. And and that's the that's the challenge we have to get to our young players is that it, it's about making sure that you're adaptable. You have you have the physical capacity, the mental, the sorry, the tacti- tactical capacity, the technical capacity, but also the ability to go and solve the problem that your opponent's going to give you. There'll be a time when your opponent's faster than you. All right, what do you do? There'll be a time when he's technically better than you. All right, what do you do? There'll be a time tactically they cause you a different problem. You'll be in a different space. How do you problem solve? Because at the highest level, at top tempo, you can't stop the game and look at the manager and ask him what to do. You have to be a proactive problem solver on your own. And and when you look at Ronaldo or Robin or even our gaffer now, Steven Gerrard, he would be able to take in more information, extrapolate a response to it and perform a high, high order action far, far faster than anyone else in the world. And when you when you think about it like that, to operate at that level it's blooming hard. It's blooming hard. So I think the team that we had there to go and do that and finish as high as we did is 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 a, is a really, 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 really good endorsement of a method and, and an ethos that worked. Yeah, and I do wonder if when you're in the uh, when you're in the Rangers dressing room occasionally with with Stevie, whether you do occasionally bring up that three-one win over. Over I can safely say I've never mentioned it. <laughs> you, well, yeah, you might find yourself quickly moving out the exit door in that case. Because there was, a, a, remember, distinctly from that game, it, him and Torres got taken off as we were taking the lead and just after our goals. And it was kind of, it kind of felt like Rafa Benitez, the manager at the time, had just almost given up. And it was like, fine, well, if we, you know, if you're happy for Reading to take the three points off you, that's that's great. And though that that win, even though that season was ultimately a, a really disappointing one. That win to to have as part of that was a you know a really brilliant moment I think. I I, I agree and I, I think that when, whenever you look at the big big teams, you look at um, points gained. So I think the only team that we didn't manage to do that to, if I remember it, was Arsenal. Mm. So we we took points off Chelsea, we took points off Man United and Liverpool. But if you look at Arsenal, I, I'm not sure we could ever get to grips with them. Do you know what I mean? Because there was there was so expansive. Um, I, I I watched a game against Arsenal and Cop, Steve Cobb was saying we need to keep them quiet for the first sixty minutes. We keep them quiet for sixty minutes. They can get a little bit um, ragged and, and and they can go a little bit gung ho trying to get a goal. And I think Thierry Henry scored after something like forty five seconds. <laughs> and you're looking at it and you're going, oh my god, this could be a long day. Because the one team you didn't want to be chasing against was them, because because their their movement and their rota- rotation and retention of the ball was such that you knew if they gave them the ball back, you'd be chasing for the next four, five, six minutes, and no matter what you did, they'd still be able to keep it. So I I, I think I think they're the only team that we didn't manage to go 
toe to toe with for at least a period of the game, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and, and, and to be fair, that one was a long day. I think we lost 4 0 that day. And it was, I, yeah. I, I remember going into that game because there was some sort of stat about a team hadn't scored in front of the North Stand for God knows months or whatever it was. It must have been since before or during the promotion season. And yep. everyone was talking about it. One Super Sunday, Arsenal turn up, Henri, as you say, 45 seconds, and, and that goes. And, and, you know, that's how it goes sometimes. And that is, yeah, the, they're the only team that did get a, um, did get sort of the, the 100% record over us. Arsenal as a club, by the way, have got a 100% record over Reading as a club. I think they've played us 13 times over the years and beaten us every single one. So, there was a mad, a, there was a mad cup game recently, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah. There's, was it? Was it seven five or? Yeah, yeah, that was the one in under McDermott, wasn't it? Which yeah. again, that like, that, that was a, a defeat wrestled from the jaws of victory from our point of view as yeah. well. Well, you, when you look at you look at those those teams and you look at, I mean, we worked out that Thierry Henry I think, in that game sprinted for a grand total of ten steps, and he was still ridiculously rapid, and you can't get close to people like that. I think I think that's what people don't get and this is this is this is something that frustrates me with um athletes in general and 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 people who who seem to know best who, who generally tend to live on twitter that um do you see these see these athletes that are getting beaten in a 1v1 situation or these athletes that are not quite making a tackle they're still ridiculous athletes they're still amazing at what they do just so happens that there are people every now and again you come up against that are even more amazing. There's a, there's a guy on on um, in the NFL that, that categorised it really well, and we talked to our young players about it. Everyone that walks into the building, everyone that walks into that level, is a good player, mm. and there are good players who are capable of great moments, and then there are great players, and the great players make good players have more great moments, and then there are stars. And the stars just are better. But no one in that level of football is anything other than a good, good, good player. So the the level I think has has, has gone up, particularly particularly physically. I I couldn't believe when we got promoted the size, the stature, and and the outright power of some of these athletes now. And I, and you, and I think you see it more and more that. Pace and, and tempo, allied to outstanding technique, is is king. Is absolute king. So you, you have to have a basic physical capacity. We we um, I think we auctioned off a, a couple of training slots for for the royal families that we did with um, the wives. Mm. And I remember the two guys that bought it both had to come out after the warm up because they nearly passed out in a warm up <laughs> we hadn't even started the drills yet and then the warm up was that extreme that we were worried they were going to have problems so we had to we had to we had to tone it down a little bit <laughs> so so people people are very very knowledgeable because football is all access now people get to see more but you can't really underestimate the raw physical demands that these guys are going through um so it is it's something that I think that bears there's talking about the fact that these guys that are losing they're not bad athletes they're not bad players alright they might have a ba- had a bad time but ultimately to get to be paid to do this job you have to be bloody good at what you do well and there were certainly some testing moments for you players like Greg Halford and, and Rossini come in these are kind of big personalities that you had to come up against and yep. how did you find that as a as a player who suddenly you think are they trying to replace me are they you know it's, it's an interesting sort of scenario for yourself then isn't it it's, it's, I, think, I think it's where Stevie Koppel really really knew me very well well I think it's, I think it's four windows in a row he brought in someone who's capable of playing right back mm. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it made me right, roll my sleeves up and say right I, I, I want to I still want to play they're going to have to they're going to have to really 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 do well to keep me out of the team Um but I think that was a mentality that I needed, and I think that it's to Steve Cobble's credit that I, I he knew me well enough to say, right, this is what we're going to do, as well as freshening up the, the changing room and, and making sure that uh, there were new faces and new people coming into the group. Um, I think he knew me really well, and I think he took great pleasure in the fact that I was irritated by it. To be honest. <laughs> 
Yeah, and then there was that as we you know get towards the end of your your time at Reading. There was sadly one of the last games you played was that that derby game and the defeat. And yeah, really, I, I, the two sort of things that I wanted to bring up about this was the first is you were the one who who fronted up almost as the as the fans sort of you know the, the chanting at the end, um, having gone down everything. You were the one who were stood in front of the fans and, and clapping and everything like that and just being there basically just just even if it was just standing around just being as part of the part of the sort of solidarity at the moment of going down but uh, allied to that what are your sort of memories of of what you told the players as captain afterwards and, and said to everyone and and how that sort of how that sort of was was rely reliant on you in effect in effect <laughs> well i think i think as much as you want you want people to be with you during good times um you, def- you definitely need them during difficult times, and, and there's no point taking adulation and, and, and kudos and, and respect and, and, and a load of credit, which we did do for getting promoted and having a fantastic first season in the Premier League. If, you, if you're then going to not be accountable for a, a, a failure, which is what it was, which is what, how it felt, we felt we felt like we'd let each other down and we'd let the club down. Um, but you have to then go and front it up. You have to own what you did. And, and I, I thought that it was it was right to do that. I know I went on uh, and did the radio show the very very next day, which was really difficult to do. But I, I thought the fans deserved that. I thought that we deserved to give it back to them and say we've 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 come up short, but the the group are really really energised to to put it right next year, and we need to say thank you for your support during the year. We really appreciate it. Just because we've had a hard time doesn't doesn't negate anything that we've gone through together, and you have to be respectful of the journey and the people who've supported you all the way through. And I thought I think it was really important that I, as the captain, as a, as a man, as a person, but as a player, also also just said, right, listen, we need you. We want to say thank you, but we need you. We you need us. We need you. Let's make sure that even though we've had a challenge, we don't actually become split. And how did that from, you know, the next season was kind of injuries and I remember being at the Cardiff game, which I think was your last game, your, your last game for the club in the, yep. in the FA Cup. And it just kind of felt like it, as it kind of felt at the end of that season with Koppel, that it just felt like the, the change of the guard needed to happen and everything. But you made that transition from a player to a fan. And I think if I'm right in saying that the, the next time we won the league, I remember seeing you in the town centre. <laughs> um, for the bus parade with with your kid on your shoulders and and thinking that yeah. that is you know it, it's un, it's it's unusual and it's it's really good to see as well as someone who you know I'm sure when you were at York and everything back in the day you you knew of Reading and you weren't you know weren't a fan or anything like that but now to 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 move into that sort of thing where after playing you still wanted to come down and and be a fan was was fascinating. Well, I. I... <laughs> My daughter found it really strange that she was sat on my shoulders um, and I had my hood up. Because normally she likes pulling my hair and tweaking my ears when yeah. she was sat on my shoulders. And I was like, listen, this, is, this isn't about me. This is about <laughs> a group of people who are going to be on a bus coming past us in a minute and, and saying well done to them because they've done something that's really, really, really hard. They deserve recognition. They deserve credit. And I actually want to say, I actually want to go and support them for for a brilliant, brilliant season. Mm. And and I thought it was really important, and I, I didn't want it. I didn't want to make too much of it, but I still wanted to go and pay my respects to them because I've got a massive connection with the club. It's been a, it's been a massive part of my life, um, and, and, I, and I look at it and I think, do you know what? That's going to be the right thing to do. And and obviously, it's very very individual to me. It's very it's very different from how some other people would do it. But I, I just thought, yeah, that feels right. I still know some of them. I still know quite a few of them, actually. I, I, I want to go and be a part of it, but I want to see it from the other side. And seeing it from the other side was brilliant. Just looking at the, looking at them, looking at the joy on their faces, brought back brilliant memories, but also allowed me, I think, a, a little bit of release and, and allowed me to let my time go. Yeah, perhaps a bit of closure in that sense. And, and my yeah, fi- possibly. Yeah, and my, and my final question, I suppose, as, as well as you talk about that, so, and before I say it, thank you, as a huge thanks to you for coming on and chatting, and obviously, you know, you're certainly a, a busy man these days, so it's always appreciated to come on and, and talk all things Reading. Um, 
how has the club changed from your perspective to now compared to how you re- when you first signed and when you left and everything how what what do you see the club as being like now in in comparison to when you when you were there um good question i haven't been back in a while i think there's been lots of changes behind the scenes obviously there's been a lot of change of ownership i think the 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 challenges of financing a push to the Premier League are far, far greater than they've ever been. Um, the, the potential rewards are are obviously immense, but the, the risk is something that needs, obviously, to be measured. And I, I think that you look at the plans for the training ground, you look at the plans for the expansion of, of the women's team, who, are, who, are, who are, I've got to say I, I, I follow as well. Um, but underpinning it all, it still feels the same to me from a distance because I can still see a thread. I can still see a thread of um, the academy being so prevalent and so strong. I can still see a, a, a real good Category 1 programme there with, with real talent pushing to come through and striving to get into the first team. I can still see a real pathway there for them. And I can still see an aspirational club. I can still see a, a, a club that has the capacity to go and really be a, a team that no one wants to play against. And listening to the rhetoric of the manager, he, I, I think he wants a, a real strong identity for his team. I think he wants a, a real method and way of playing that is recognisable and identifiable really easily. Um, I think what we were really good at was that after a period of time, we really got it down to a, to a, a fine, fine art. And, and I hope that the players and the fans can really start to appreciate what they have. Because, all right, there's, there's, there's lots and lots of teams that want to do well. There's teams that want to go and crack on and, and, and get into the Premier League. But there are also teams that have gone to the wire. There are also teams that have gone to the wall. There's teams that have really stretched beyond their means. And I, w- I would never say don't be aspirational. I would never say don't chase the next thing. But it has to be done within the, the, the limits of what you have in your spending potential. You have to make sure you safeguard the club. You have to make sure that we have a club to, re- to support in the future. Um, and Obviously, I'm not as close to it. I don't see. But hopefully, the business model is is sustainable. Hopefully, the football is good. And hopefully, we get to a stage where there's 24,500 people in the Medeski right behind the team and getting the atmosphere rocking again because when it's full and when it's bouncing, it's a brilliant environment to play in. I'm hopeful that getting that back won't be too far away. Um, obviously, we're, we're living in, in challenging times at the moment, but I'm hopeful that coming out of all of the challenge, capable of surprising a few people and, and really making people sit up and take notice. And if we manage to do that, then I think it would be a great thing, not only for the team, but also for the, for the, for the town. Yeah, here, here, and I think it's certainly a case, as you say, there surprising people is something that Reading have always liked to do. We've always liked being that club that have come from nowhere and 100%. And, and being that team that that surprises as the underdog, and that is certainly what we can hope to do in the uh, you know the coming seasons as we, as you say, get out of this sort of situation we're in. So, Graham Murphy, thank you very much for coming on and having a nice uh, a nice Friday afternoon reminiscing of uh, of all the good times. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you very very much for having me. And have a good evening, mate. Thank you. Stay safe. For all the latest Reading news, analysis and opinion, visit the website at thetilehurstend.com.